I'd like to call this meeting to order of the Norco City Council. Uh, we have the roll call, please. Councilmember Newton? Here. Councilmember Hoffman? Here. Councilmember Grunmeyer? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bash? Here. Mayor Hanna? Here. All present. Okay, now if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pastor Rolando Rosales from Beacon Hill Assembly of God Church. And it's I think Brian, would you lead us in the invocation, please? <laughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, bless these people who are here tonight to deal with the city of Norco. Provide us with wisdom so that we may unite our community and forever uh, be bestowed to you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay, first item, we have uh, introductions of our uh, city employees. Uh, the first one is Melvin Sparks, Animal Control Superintendent, and I'll let the Deputy City Manager Petrie take that, please. Thank you, members of the council and audience. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Melvin Sparks III, our new superintendent of Norco Animal Control Services. Uh, just in history, uh, Melvin is our fifth animal control shelter manager and superintendent in the last 56 years. Melvin was born and raised in Southern California and first started his career in animal welfare and animal shelter operations with the Los Angeles Department of Animal Care and Control in 2004 where Melvin was responsible for shelter operation, care, and animal welfare. As a certified technician, he trained staff and covered call in the South Bay area of Los Angeles where he had after hour and emergency call responsibilities. Melvin also provided educational awareness to schools and the public in animal welfare. Melvin then went to work for the city of Redondo Beach in 2008 uh, for, the de for the police department as a municipal service officer where he handed, handled code enforcement, traffic enforcement and animal control services assisted in the also in DUI checkpoints hear that lieutenant you can do that as well and provided education in school and animal welfare lessons within the community the city of Norco in 2013 uh, hired Melvin as our senior animal control officer Melvin oversaw field operations uh, case management kennel and office staff in December of this last year Melvin was appointed as our interim superintendent for animal Norco Animal Control Services uh, after the announcement and retirement of Frankie Skagmaliglio, who served the city for 29 years. Melvin has over 16 years of animal control uh, care and officer experience, uh, is also certified in PC 832, and is a graduate of the State of California Advanced Animal Control Academy. Melvin and his wife Crystal live in Riverside with their three energetic children, I'm told. As I do, as I know I do, as you do, Let's welcome Melvin uh, Sparks III as our new city superintendent of Norco Animal Control Services. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> well, we've been here for this be seven years pretty soon, so I'm pretty sure all of you guys know me, and if you don't, I'm pretty sure we'll get to know each other. But grateful for the opportunity and grateful for every moment. Thank you very much. And Melvin. Yes, sir. I got to tell everybody that uh, yesterday was your big first big incident as the leader of the Norco Animal Control, and you did one heck of a good job. We appreciate everything that you did yesterday in helping. I right, thank you very much. 
Oh, uh, this one of them. <laughs> we did a whole uniform markup, so this is kind of one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next one is uh, Todd Shank, Parks and Building Superintendent. Mr. Member, Council, and audience, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Todd Shank as our new Superintendent of Parks and Public Facilities. Uh, Todd comes to us after the announcement and retirement of Hank Koch, who worked for the city for uh, almost 19 years as our superintendent and also as one of our park supervisors. Uh, Todd was born in Cleveland, Ohio, moved to Southern California in 1985, grew up near uh, Santa Clarita and Agua de Lucy uh, on five acres riding horses and motorcycles. He loved the outdoors and was a Boy Scout growing up and appreciated nature. That led Todd, I think, to his next step, which is to going to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Horticulture Science, concentrating in turf management. Todd worked in golf course industry for over 17 years in management of golf courses as a superintendent. He also has worked for golf courses in turf management, horticulture, and advising and maintenance from North Northern California to Southern California. He moved to the city of Riverside in 05, where he met his wife Jeannie in 07. They currently live in Riverside with their three ch active children, Dylan, Katie, and Cooper. Todd made a, this transition from uh, the private sector and golf course operation and management uh, and started to work for the city of Alhambra, where he was the uh, operations manager and superintendent for the city there and oversaw operations and maintenance from buildings, playgrounds, golf course Courses, golf course, parks, urban forest program, including park capital projects and contract maintenance and oversight, uh, and dealing with all of the city's service maintenance contractors. Please welcome Todd Shank to our city as our new superintendent of parks and public facilities. Todd. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Um, we touched on yesterday. It was really cool to see a community come together and actually react quite quickly. So it's, for me, it's I, I like the small town feel. Um, I, as he's kind of said, I grew up in it, and it's nice to get back to it. And um, this is a testament to the people. I mean, I think, let's see, three of the people up here on, on the panel, or the council, if you will, were all there in different roles last night. I thought that was amazing. So I'm glad to be here. Look, at, look forward to helping out and keep Norco going the way we need to go. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to have you here, too. Okay, next is uh, the city manager will introduce our finance director, Lisette Free. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, our agenda tonight is very light, so this is a great night to introduce a lot of new employees and, and, and a lot of promotions that are happening in the organization. I, I am very proud of what we are doing here. Uh, if you look around, this is, in, in fact, uh, the future of city management uh, is part of our succession plan. And uh, uh, including Todd, who is new to the city, I, I am very proud of all of you. I'm looking for great things to come from all of you uh, in the near future. Uh, with that, I would introduce our new finance director, uh, Ms. Lisette Free. Uh, she's going to be heading our fiscal and support services department. And this department is very critical to the operations of the city. Uh, department is responsible for a wide range of essential functions, uh, including accounting and financial reporting, utility billing, budgeting, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, debt administration, cash and investments management, cashiering and business license. Uh, the finance director is a key member of the city's executive uh, management team. Uh, Ms. Free joined the city in 2017 uh, after more than 20 years of uh, uh, service in the public sector, including public accounting and her service working for the County of Orange. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in accounting uh, from Azusa Pacific University and holds professional licenses as a certified public accountant as well as a certified fraud examiner. Uh, Ms. Free also is an active member of the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers Association, as well as the Government 
finance, or finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada. Uh, Ms. Free resides in Harupa Valley uh, with her two sons and her husband, uh, two sons aged 11 and 14, uh, when she's not working in the finance department, which takes a lot of her time, uh, she spends her, her, her free time with the Boy Scouts and, and her, her two boys are, are, are in the Scout. And, uh, in addition to that, uh, she enjoys uh, uh, providing uh, Sunday school to toddlers uh, in her church. Uh, Ms. Free has indicated to me her first priority with the city is excellent customer service. I am certainly looking forward to her contributions to the city and I'm delighted that she is a member of the city's executive management team. Welcome, Lisette Free. Thank you uh, very much for for that. Um, I in what year 20, 2012, um, I was actually given permanent disability work papers. So to be here um, with this opportunity it means a lot to me. Um, excuse me. You broke it. <laughs> um, you know, when at that time it was, you know, um, my my um, boss at the time said, you know, we're going to work with you. You're you're going to get better. You're going to um, we're going to get through this, and you're going to retire from here. Okay, that's the plan. Um, was able to work through it all, and um, when I came to the city, I was like, you know. He's like, go, it's, it's, it'll be perfect, you'll be closer to home, you won't work Fridays. <laughs> um, that has not worked. Right? The, the work-life balance would, you know, will help your kids. And, and I said, oh, okay. He's, and so through that blessing, I, um, I, I'm actually very honored and humbled to uh, be here and be able to be part of this city, especially with the small town feel. Um, just from yesterday's event, today we did receive the majority of our calls, um, even though it was shut off day, were to thank the, um, the city for their hard work and um, what they did yesterday. So I just want to say thank you once again, and I'm glad to be here. And um, you know, I'm learning a lot, and I'll continue to work with you guys and the uh, customers. Thank you. Thank you, Lizette. We're happy to have you. Our next employee recognition is uh, Public Works Director Chad Blass will recognize uh, or introduce uh, Sam Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is a position that uh, with the support of the City Council, as you know, uh, we developed for not only for as the city manager talked about with succession planning, uh, trying to you know, make sure that we support and have a plan for the future. Uh, but it was also very much of a need for me in the engineering department to get more staff um, to help us support all the projects that we are have been successful in getting out, but we're looking to do. Uh, so having another body in that role to support that and give a high level uh, overview of everything we're doing and, and do project management has been very critical. Um, thankfully, as part of this process, and which we always try to encourage and like to see is uh, we did our interview process and we actually ended up promoting internally rather than outside, which is always a great thing. We want to see our employees desire to be more involved in, in the organization. Uh, so Sam applied and, and we ended up offering him the position to be our new deputy, deputy direct Deputy Director of Public Works, Deputy City Engineer. Um, and with the role of the assumption in the near future when our current city engineer does retire, uh, we will likely transition that role and remove the deputy as far as for the city uh, civil engineer, city engineer uh, from that title um, and uh, have a full-time uh, city engineer. But for now, Sam's the deputy. He's been given... Uh, 
some hefty tasks to work over the next year and work with me and Andy and Brian to really embrace that role. Uh, we think he's going to do uh, very good things for us and we have a lot of confidence in Sam. Uh, Sam started working here in uh, Norco about five, uh, six years ago um, as an associate engineer and now and he became the senior engineer and now he's going to be our, our deputy uh, city engineer. So uh, he's, uh, I'm not sure what Sam does in his free time, but he's not going to have any more free time because uh, he's going to have a lot of stuff that he's going to help me uh, do and keep up the pace with the amount of work and projects that the council and the community are looking for us to do. Uh, but uh, it's part of what we enjoy, and uh, so I, I look forward to that. I do want to remind folks that Sam is our current um, employee of the year, so he's had a very good year, uh, and he's continuing that role. Um, but I have a lot of confidence in Sam. He's got a he, he's a graduate from Cal Poly Pomona, like I am, um, and he's got his PE, and so he's a professional engineer. Uh, so and Sam, uh, like I said, he's an extremely hard worker. Uh, does anything that anyone needs to do, needs to do, and he's got tons of energy. Was what I I look forward to and need. Uh, so we're just going to mold him and, and try to uh, make him the best uh, person he can be. That that gives us the the resources that we need. So with that, um, happy to introduce Sam Nelson as our new deputy city engineer. Deputy Director of Public Works. City for this opportunity. I actually left the job six years ago that I really, really loved and was nervous about this, but at this point, it's the best decision I ever made. Thank you. Okay, our next one is a presentation to Fire Chief Scott Lane, and if I get my colleagues to join me down below here, we'll give him this certificate, and everybody can <laughs> tell him what you think of him. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it clean. Your patron is in office. Yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, you got two Broncos and four Mustang in them. You She's, she snuck in on you. <laughs> this is kind of a sad deal today. Uh, we got a certificate here to present you for everything you've done for your years of dedicated service to the city of Norco. And uh, I'd like to say a few words of the, a lot of the stuff you've done. You've really. Uh, moved up uh, everything that there is for the DART team. A lot better equipment, more equipment, and uh, lots of help. You were instrumental in getting us a contract with the County of Riverside to go through, uh, be able to use their animal services and work with those guys. And uh, Last night's the fourth night we've fourth month we've trained with them. We've had uh, three times we've had 12 officers there and, uh, and one time we had 18 so it's going to be a good deal to have all the help plus the explorers and everything. I'll give you this little certificate and then let uh, everybody else say what they want to say. This is the city of Norco hereby recognizes Chief Scott Lane for proudly leaving the, leading the Norco Fire Department consistently advocating for the city of Norco and ensuring the community has the resources required to keep residents, animals, and property safe. And uh, with this, I'll give this to you. Appreciate everything you've done there, big guy. They've been sending really mean text for two days. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to go well. <laughs> All right. Well. 
So the first time I met this gentleman, he was actually saving my house, if you remember. Right behind where I live, it was burning up. So uh, you've just done a fabulous job. I love Cal Fire. You just totally exemplify, exemplify for me why we made that move. I mean, the department just gets stronger and better and better. And I really feel like you all live in our community and that you are part of our community. So I, I really do thank you. I'm going to re reiterate what uh, Berwin said. Uh, you've taken our NART team to a new level with all the help you, you put together and all the equipment. Uh, we don't have to worry about the old engine anymore breaking down or uh, having a horse come pull it out or tow it. But uh, really, uh, it's not only you, it's all the staff and, you, uh, and all the other BCs and the captains that you they emulate your style, and that's a good thing. That should be uh, one of the things. Uh, this is the, uh, the the best thing we we ever did for our city is is going to Cal Fire and to bring in all the professionalism and the help that we have. We appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. So I would just like to say, as a newer council member, thank you for your time training me and helping me to learn the ways of CAL FIRE and even today um, the chief offered to take us out and show us what happened and kind of explain everything and how things are paid for and how everything works so you taking the time today when I know you have a million things to do to help educate the council members is greatly appreciated and then I do appreciate your sense of humor uh, it has been wonderful to work with you and um, I would like to say my text message was not me no. I am pretty sure I said congratulations it had balloons. after, and it had balloons. So, um, but thank you for everything uh, that you've done for the city of Norco. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, 90 days is 90 what I've days. heard. Okay. Mark that on your it, it is. <laughs> well, I don't have much to say about it. <laughs> say that again. Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> and maybe a few too many. Um, <laughs> you, you know I'm going to miss you. Um, I don't want to really re reiterate too much on how much you've done for NART, your professionalism that you've you've brought with Cal Fire to the city, the the seamless transition. Uh, going from our own fire department to Cal Fire. I mean, it's just kudos to you for all of that. Um, it, it's more the, the personal time that uh, this morning I got to take a tour with uh, Chief Lane uh, of the fire in the area and the terminology and the verbiage he uses you know, can't be repeated here. Um, <laughs> And how he really feels about a lot of us. <laughs> okay, um, it's an interesting dynamic. So I'm going to miss you and your harassment, and um, hope you're back in 90 days or less. I'm pretty sure Andy made those uh, threats today with our administration. Actually, I, I did. Uh, before he says something, I, I did actually uh, reach out to. Uh, Riverside County Fire Department uh, Chief uh, Todd Williams and they pleaded with him to uh, keep uh, uh, Chief BC here and uh, so he has withdrawn uh, the 90 day appointment. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, no, uh, no. Actually, uh, uh, they are obviously very proud of Chief Land and uh, the ability, uh, his abilities, what he means to Cal Fire, as we all have seen here. Uh, he meant a lot to us, and he uh, uh, meant a lot to the community. Uh, even though uh, we are we are on contract with Cal Fire, the reality of it is we have 
taken him and seen him as part of our staff, and uh, he, he he has made a big difference in terms of how the community perceives our our relationship with Car Fire and how the fire department has been operating since he has been here as a Car Fire Battalion Chief. And certainly, uh, again, Car Fire is very proud of him, and uh, uh, they are looking for him to do uh, good things in the future for Car Fire. Um, our our loss is there again, but we are a partner in this arrangement and uh, will continue to benefit from all the accomplishment he's going to achieve in the future. One more thing. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of Fourth of Julys ago, you know, in the evenings we have our little task force that's uh, with the sheriff department, uh, fire, code enforcement, animal control, where we go out and look for fireworks. And had the opportunity to ride with the chief and council member Grunmeyer, who I wish will comment after me, but I did not know you could drive across this town in less than six minutes, okay, in the middle of the night, and had the most hysterical evening with you, and I'll never forget that. And if you want to add to your experience. <laughs> well, you have to say why we had to drive so fast. That's right. Yeah. It's because... Robin is a school teacher, high school teacher, and she wanted to catch her. Students. I wanted to catch somebody so bad that night, <laughs> so I was like, "We got to do it." So I, yeah. he, you made it happen. Yeah. We won't say how, but we did bust some people that night. So it was a good night. I wanted to get somebody, and, and Scott made it happen. So. Well, we can't tell that part. We might have crossed a border to bust somebody, but that's okay. I got one more thing. Before you go. <laughs> One more thing before you uh, get up here to speak, Chief. No matter how far you run, you will never escape us. We will always have you. Matt. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Chief. You're still in the parade. <laughs> 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 Chief couldn't come to the parade one year. I don't remember. Newton, do you remember which was this horse week or the Labor Day parade? I can't remember. So uh, Robin had this cutout made and Ted had the bull. So Chief got to ride a bull in the parade that day and uh, everybody's trying to figure out what he was doing. But... <laughs> why he wouldn't wave at him, but <laughs> anyway, you'll never escape us, Chief. We're going to always have this video because I've got it on my phone. Anyway, I'll let you talk now. <laughs> well, I got, uh, I got a buckle on it because it was way over eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> it set a new world record, so uh, thank you to the council and staff for this wonderful roast this evening. Uh, for those that don't know, I've accepted a 60-90 day uh, acting position as a unit administrative officer in headquarters so I'll uh, <clears throat> hopefully be back however I'm not not certain but uh, you're still being the parade there's been a significant number of death threats the last two days since uh, news broke and I was trying to command a fire yesterday and the phone wouldn't stop in the text messages so thank you all for that <laughs> while I was trying to focus on saving homes so uh, as you all know, uh, the staff and, and council members, you've all been, we've all become family. And uh, from stealing Steve's Diet Coke <laughs> to trying to find Chad in City Hall. Uh, yeah. Kevin and I last week went on a search party for you, and we don't know where you were, but we're going to get you a GPS so we can find you on our phones. We can never find you, but it's great. It's a fun game. Matt. What a relationship we've had in the last few years. Uh, Matt's our IT and works in the Village of the Nerds. Uh, so graciously identified by, by the mayor. And uh, we catch him all the time playing video games there in the back, but it's okay because he gets the new ones. Dana, you've been so wonderful since you came in. Brian, since day one, eight years ago, I hope to be back, man. But... We'll see how that goes. 
um, from getting hand-me-down Boy Scout supplies <laughs> to uh, now Lizette went on that. So <clears throat> yeah, so what a relationship we've had, and Lizette, we've worked uh, the last couple years together, and it's been a pleasure, Lieutenant. <laughs> I don't know what you do and how you do it, but uh, I swear to you folks, there was 50 deputies yesterday out there uh, after I called Mayday and broke an arrow and told the lieutenant I needed him out there at the command post. And he's so wonderful that every time we have a major incident, he jumps in one of our trucks and uh, kind of takes it over, which is great. But um, yesterday, just a little testament. He uh, was actually our Secret Service agent, why Chief Ike and I were trying to command this fire and told everybody to call him, don't call us, because we're too busy. And uh, that's a partnership. So you gotta listen to him, because he's got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, he takes it out in the cars, it's crazy. It's, don't knock on the window if the, if the LT is in the car. Berwin, uh, I'm glad my wife's here, because she still has a bone to pick with you about taking our, uh, at the time, five-year-old last year <laughs> back into the stock area at the, at the rodeo. And uh, I told my wife, she's like, what's he going to do if the bull comes and comes after our daughter? And I said, oh, he's like Crocodile Dundee. He got, he's got this. He's a, he's a bull whisperer, too. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and our little daughter had a great old time. And then the bull hit the, hit the rails. And wow. <laughs> Ted, it's been great. I haven't been able to get you in my truck. You will, you refuse to ride in the fire truck from your sheriff's days. Uh, well, you, after I creased the cab that time, I figured I'm going to stay away. Well, that was your dually. Yeah. That was an art dually. Give him a nice new truck, and Ted put a dent in it. So. <laughs> Kevin, from, from from the first time I, I met you in your backyard running around with a shovel, uh, <laughs> That was something, you know, and it's been an honor to be here from day one, eight years ago, as a captain of 47, and then to be the chief. It's just been great, um, phenomenal. Robin, <clears throat> I've been out of high school for almost three decades, and she still scares the hell out of me <clears throat> as a high school teacher. <clears throat> but <clears throat> absolutely, chief drive faster, okay. Uh, but. <laughs> She's wonderful, brings goodies to the fire station every year. I don't know where she gets it, but this 40 pound turkey shows up to cook for the firefighters and we can't even fit it in any device we have. <laughs> so it's been cut with a chainsaw, a sawzall, you name it. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for the goodies, the candies, the support, and all of you. Uh, it, it's for council members and staff. You know, we have 15 firefighters in this city and every one of them know you by name. And that's this community, and that's what it is, you know, and uh, it's wonderful. <sighs> to you, <clears throat> Mr. Newton, and the other half over there. <laughs> been a great friendship, you know, we're all friends, and it's wonderful. And I truly hope to be back in three months, but uh, I'm not sure if Andy ruined that today or not. <laughs> uh, so we'll see how it goes. And we'll, of course, we'll always be in contact. If you could... Uh, change the cell plan for Kelly because the uh, the hate text in the last two days has been extreme. Uh, uninvited to the wedding. <clears throat> but there isn't even a date or a wedding plan. It's just we're out. <laughs> so, my friendly neighborhood dog catcher. <laughs> he says to me a couple weeks ago, what am I, Spider-Man? <laughs> I said, no, man, you're just a friendly neighborhood dog catcher. <clears throat> I appreciate the friendship. I appreciate what you've done for NART, what you've uh, done to my firefighters, making them feel horrible about themselves. <clears throat> I love it. Todd, I wish we got to spend more time together, but we just met last night, and uh, <laughs> I'm glad there's a Hank in your name. you got big shoes to fill, and, and I'm sure Burr will hold you up to that. Sam, it's always a pleasure. Kelly, you're a huge troublemaker. I appreciate everything you've done for us. Leah's back there smiling, even Corinne. Thank you, everybody. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in a couple months. If not, I'm sure my replacement will uh, leave within the first half hour of council. <laughs> Thank you.
you Lizette will pay for it. <laughs> She's got the checkbook. <laughs> yeah, we have friends. Lizette's got the checkbook. Oh, <laughs> Got so this. Got the yeah, right here. Right. Well, it's a do we have a presentation to do that? Okay, our next item is a presentation. Uh, I'd like to call on the Chief Executive Officer of Corona Norco United Way, Alia Rodriguez, to give an update on the United Way, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Little known fact, uh, Scott Lane was actually my captain for a few years when I worked in the 911 Dispatch Center for Riverside County Fire, Cal Fire. And it's really nice to see you as a chief now and that your humor hasn't changed because you used to keep us laughing on graveyard, day shift, and swing shift. So congratulations on your, your temporary assignment. I'm sure you're going to do great. <coughs> So uh, I wanted to thank you all for giving me the time to speak to you. I know your time is valuable. Um, I wanted to introduce myself as the new Chief Executive Officer for the Corona Norco United Way. And actually we uh, are a nonprofit organization that we actually currently reside in the city of Corona, but we serve as Corona, Norco, Eastvale, portions of Harupa Valley, and Home Gardens. And I think that's kind of a little known fact for the community, what we do. So I wanted to get in front of you all just to see what we're all about and make sure that we, we are on your mind when it comes to enhancing and bettering the community. So let me go backwards. Um, so again, I just this is our mission here, and this is some of our staff and our youth board. Uh, we provide free educational, financial, and healthy living programs to those most in need. So these are folks that are typically, that either come from a domestic violence situation, families, women, uh, men, children. We service uh, them by intake processes, and I'll talk about a little bit what we do in that regard. But we also provide educational support for the children and for the families, and we provide financial stability programs at free of charge uh, to the communities that we serve. So really quickly on education, and I've been in talks with Norco College, so I'm really um, anxious to learn more about all the things that Norco College is doing and the niche that they're creating as a, as a college here. Uh, but we have three different programs that we offer in terms of education, and I know you have Norco High School um, and a very, a very uh, other schools in the community, but we have one program that's called the Children and Youth Success Program, and these are free services available for third through 11th grade, and these are often the kids that are uh, low poverty, extreme low poverty students that need access to technology after hours, they need help with their homework, they need help um, just kind of, a lot of these kids that we see they're because they're low income, they're either living in cars with their mothers, their fathers, their grandparents, or going from house to house, so they're usually in families in transition. And what we do is we give them the social emotional support and on top of the academic support that they need. So if there's demographics here in the city of Norco that your, your um, schools need that service, we do get referrals from the Parent Center from the Corona Norco Unified School District, and we've made our um, presence known to the school district Board of Education last night as well. We also have what's called a Paths to Success program, and these are for folks that we're not able to obtain a high school diploma, a GED, or a high school equivalency. So what we do is we take in folks that qualify for our program, uh, low income yet again, and we provide them the services in partnership with the school district um, that they can obtain their GED so that they can get out into the workforce and apply for jobs. Uh, one thing that I learned in a Census Bureau meeting um, with Dana, uh, I believe it was last month, is that the Census Bureau is hiring quite a bit, so we've been able to take that information, pass it on to some of our clients that we serve at United Way and tell them, hey, listen, there's work out 
out there and this is how you can you can get some money in your pocket and kind of get your family back on track so it's it's a neat program that we have and always looking for partnerships on how to get folks uh, financially stable and then the last one is one that I'm really excited about um, we have what's called a bright scholars program so these are for the students that are extremely high achieving kids but that are low income and so maybe they don't have the same luxuries or the same affordability in their families to take the SAT and to get a college education so what we do is we take the best and the brightest based on a screening process and we put them through a six-week course for G for SATs uh, 9th through 12th grade we prioritize them from 12th grade but we prioritize the 11th and 12th graders first obviously and then go down from there and we pay for everything we pay as a nonprofit we pay for their testing we pay for their classes uh, we buy them lunch we give them water and we give them also counseling educational counseling how to fill out your FAFSA and how to just be successful when you get into college and kind of give them the confidence that they need in order to break the cycle of the families that they've been in and get out there and be in the workforce and be a productive uh, citizen. So that's a little bit on our education side. Um, on our health side, um, this is an unfortunate side of what we do, but it's a, it's a, something that I want to make sure is known because it's not always talked about. But we do have a domestic violence program where we intake clients um, of every color, race, gender, whatever it might be, that they've come in and we provide uh, compassionate advocates for them. We do intaking. We help get them through a 16-week counseling session that we provide on-site at our location. We give them support groups. A lot of folks that come in don't have access to uh, financial resources, legal aid restraining order things of that nature and so we help them through that process and we will physically go sit through court with them uh, help them fill out paperwork and just kind of give them the support that they need as their advocate in a non-judgmental very compassionate surrounding uh, we also have plan uh, safety plan for them so if they're uh, you know the assailant is the perpetrator is trying to get at them or get with the with the students we work closely with Corona Police Department and trying to develop partnerships with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department as well uh, to, to develop that so that they know that we're a resource for the f victims of domestic violence and then we also do referrals because we realize we can't do it all so there's a lot of uh, resources out there and we've created resource guides where we can refer people um, out to the different resources whether it's sheltering or uh, public utility assistance whatever it might be uh, we also do the same thing for the children that are involved unfortunately we do get cases of domestic abuse against children and sexual abuse and so what we do is we help those children with coping skills emotional development and then again with the homework assistance and tutoring in a very loving and non-biased uh, environment it's interesting to see the kids that walk through there and they come in scared of themselves not able to introduce themselves and then by the end of the session they're happy they have a snack in their bellies and they're you know kind of talking and introducing themselves and for these children sometimes that's the hardest thing for them to do is just to be able to talk to somebody so I'm glad that we're able to give them that support one thing that we're uh, really excited about is income and so we're trying to teach not providing income because we're a nonprofit so you know we're not relying on taxpayer dollars but we're trying we're doing fundraising and campaigns but what we do is we try to teach our, our clients the financial independence so we teach them how to manage expenses how to make decisions prioritize their money um, especially the folks like if we have a client that came in that was a victim of domestic violence didn't have the GED we get them the GED they get into the workforce now how do you manage your money now that you're standing on your own two feet how do you do that and where can you get low cost housing and things of that nature so that's one program we offer and then newly this one is really exciting because we have a youth board um, and we're looking to engage narco high school students right now most of our youth board is uh, made up of Centennial and Santiago high school students but we're looking to expand that to all of the high schools in the district Roosevelt Norco and have representation from all the communities that we serve but I tell you what we have 17 of the best and brightest kids that sit on our board that are very very passionate about giving back to their community whether it's painting curves or feeding children whatever it might be they're there and uh, one thing that they came to us recently and said hey guys we have a need we like to give but we have a need we realize that we're smart and we're in school and we have cell phones but we have no idea how to do anything in life like zero we have zero skills we have no idea so we developed this little class that we're going to be starting and I believe in a month it's called adulting 101 and so we're going to do quick 15 minute presentations to our youth board and show them how to budget um, what is a credit card what is an annual percentage rate how to respect money finance credit scores how to fill out a financial aid and we even have it beyond income where the students have asked can you show us how to change a tire can you show us how to sew a button can you show us what a payphone is can you show us just the basic fundamentals to, to live because we have no idea what we're doing. We don't even know how to communicate half the time because we're on our cell phones the whole time and we're like, absolutely. So we're getting the community involved. I'd love to have presentations from folks in Corona to talk about some of these life skills that they just need to know how to do. And so we're really excited to launch that in the next month. 
Um, we also have volunteer opportunities. We've been uh, really, I've only been in my position here at the United Way for about two and a half months now, so it's still very, very new. I came from a very long uh, career in government for 15 years, so the segue into the nonprofit world was um, quite different. But uh, what I've been doing is going out to all the city councils of the areas that we serve, give a presentation, uh, letting them know who we are, but we also are doing the same thing with our corporate um, sponsors that are in the community. Most recently, Monster Energy was very interested in a volunteer opportunity. Now that they know what we do and who we are, now they're like, well, how else can we help? How else can we do this and give it back so that we know our money and our donations are going directly back into the community that we work and live in? And that expands out to Norco and uh, Eastvale as well. So we have volunteer opportunities, not just with the youth board, but we're looking for folks that want to come and tutor. We tutor uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights. Uh, we're looking for child care workers on a, a, a interim basis. It's not continual. Special presen presenters, so sometimes we get those kids in the homework club and the tutoring. We like to have people come and talk about the different career choices. Not everything has to be about college, but trade school, vocational school. What else is there that people can do um, that, that attract the kids? And they get excited when we just had UCR students, medical students come out, students that were from Corona and Norco come out and talk about their experiences growing up here and then coming back and saying this is what I'm doing with my life and the kids really enjoyed that. Uh, we do participate in you know tree lighting ceremonies and those kinds of things so any events that um, should council see fit for us to come out and support we're happy to do so and then corporate opportunities so we do honor corporate we I think we had Orkin bug control call us yesterday and say hey we need a project do you have one for us and so we're looking to develop um, now that I'm in place we're looking to develop community impact projects the most recent recent one that we're doing that the youth board's been passionate about is uh, renovating the settlement house that's in Corona. So if you guys all know what that is, it's been in, I think it's been in existence since 1914. Um, we've been working with the CEO there, and it's it's the great organization, but the building's dilapidated. It's you know run down, and so we're planning for a May date. We're going to renovate the inside. We're going to paint everything. We're going to organize everything, and then we're going to trim all the bushes. We're going to paint all the stripes on the concrete. We're just going to do that. So we're going to be active out there looking for sponsors and donors and uh, volunteers to help us. And we want to have a very uh, ambitious turnaround time of two days to get all of it done. So we're looking for volunteers for that, and our high school students that we've reached out to. Um, we have about a hundred and thirty that are very interested in helping with that. So that's what we're doing and we're looking for that kind of community impact in all of the areas that we serve, not just in the city of Corona, but all the areas that we serve. So just want to put that on your on your mind. Um, and then we're also on social media. Um, we're very small and modest right now, but my my desire isn't to necessarily grow the organization, but to find what those unique needs are in each community, because every city that we've talked to is very, very different in their dynamics and their needs. And the luxury that I have in being the CEO of a nonprofit is I can create different kinds of programs to meet the need of the community. And I, that's really what I'm interested in doing, is not doing what we've always done, but do what we can for each community that we serve. So that's, in a nutshell, what we do. And I wanted to thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Anyone have any questions? Like that's, a, that's okay. Thank you. Like you did a good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for Appreciate coming. It. Of course. Appreciate it. Okay. Item number one on the council agenda is uh, the city council communication reports on regional boards and commissions. We'll start out with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bash. Uh, just a couple of things. The um, Today we planted a rose, Brian. Thank your staff. They were wonderful for Audrey. Uh, it was really, it was, it was very cool. Really appreciate it. Not a big turnout, but her friends were all there, so that was nice. And then I just want to remind everybody that Saturday we're doing a uh, our film festival, and that is to directly support high school kids at Norco High School um, who need... AP test fees, they need SAT test fees, they need college entrance exam or college entrance fees uh, to, to apply. Um, or even, I think we just paid for a prom dress. And um, so that will go from 10 to 4. Uh, we're showing actors and actresses that have been to Norco. They either went to the old Naval Hospital or the old resort. Charlie Chaplin, Jack Benny, people like that, people you've never heard of. But uh, the films are basically prior to everybody knowing what 
the Nazis were doing. They were doing spoofs making fun of Hitler. And the whole lesson is, is midday we're having um, um, the daughter of the Eisen family who started the old egg ranch. Uh, he was an Auschwitz survivor who escaped and she was a f uh, Jewish freedom fighter. And so what we want to do is we want to bring it home and make sure people understand, because uh, we're forgetting, they're not teaching it in school anymore, exactly what happened and why people were, I mean these actors and actresses when they made these films spoofing this guy, making fun of him, they actually had prices put on their head by the Nazi party. So anyway, 10 to 4, the Lions Club is going to support us, they're going to be giving, uh, having food and things like that. It should be a pretty good day. Five dollars for the whole day, so I hope to see you there. That's all I have, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Grunmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The only thing that I would like to share today is um, Senator Roth and Assemblymember Cervantes hosted um, the Home Insurance Roundtable with um, our Insurance Commissioner for the State of California, Ricardo Laura, and they have been going out to the different counties uh, to do visits with people um, as far as homeowners insurance and with the wildfires and things that have happened in California, the, um, their department has seen a 600% increase of non-renewals since 2010. Uh, there's been over 200 rate increases. Uh, there's a lack of available insurance by traditional means. Um, and so, they're going out and meeting with people, seeing what specific issues are, trying to work with insurance companies, but what I took away from the day is if you're having issues with a non-renewal or huge increases in insurance rates, you need to reach out to the California um, Department of Insurance and let them know your story so that they can take the steps to help you through the process. Uh, you know, with what happened yesterday and even before yesterday, there have been some um, stories around town where people's in, uh, insurance is increasing or they've been uh, cut from ins insurance and it's a really serious problem. And it's something that they are trying, the Department of Insurance is trying to kind of wrap their hands around. Uh, so they need to know the individual stories because everybody's circumstances are so different. So if we have anybody in Norco that is having problems with a spike in insurance or uh, threats of non-renewal, please reach out to Insurance Commissioner Laura um, and his staff. They're very, very responsive. Uh, they did a great job on the presentation the other day, and uh, I'm hoping that his staff and his department will be able to uh, make some progress with some of the assembly bills and senate bills that they have moving forward to kind of get um, honor, homeowners insurance in check, um, but definitely something that's important to several residents in the city of Norco. That's all I have. Thank you. Next is Council Member Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to drop down real quick. Uh, meetings and busy, but uh, the one thing that's important is our Veterans Committee meeting was the Ingalls Veterans Memorial Committee meeting. We were discussing uh, to create a better ADA access and improvements to the memorial. As well as you know, the memorial has been there. There hasn't been a whole lot done to it. We've done a lot of discussion. Well, the committee the other day authorized uh, for about $27,000 worth of engineering plans to go through uh, to develop a better ADA access and a pad for uh, the Gold Star Family Memorial uh, up there. Um, <clears throat> What this is going to do, though, is going to almost deplete any of the funds that we have. So we are going to be out as the Veterans Memorial Committee looking to augment those. And once we get those back, we'll have a better idea uh, from from uh, for public and uh, private donations to finish this uh, project up. As you know, the memorial is the shining light here in the city, uh, respecting all of our veterans and those that served. Uh, so we want to make sure that 
people having access, the ADA access will not only just be an easy way to push wheelchairs, it's going to be an inner, um, an interpretive trail that will have uh, stages on up to the park that what we're looking for is to teach our young children and to in our all our uh, residents here when they go up different aspects of being the veterans and all the contribution that our area has made uh, in defense of this country and finally if Matt if I can get you to pop that up on March 29th um, <coughs> We are going to be commemorating National Vietnam War Veterans Day. It's a Sunday, March 29th, and I'm um, inviting, I don't care if you're uh, like myself, a Vietnam veteran, but if you are any veteran, come on up because I'm going to feed you a free hamburger. Okay, bring you yourself and your family, and we're going to eat the hamburgers up there at Nellie Weaver Hall, and uh, get the rest of the Veterans Committee, you can meet them. We'll have a short program, it won't be much, and then if the weather's good, uh, we'll take a walk over the memorial and we'll give you a little docent tour of what we're trying to accomplish over there. So this is your memorial, your city, but please, uh, if you know a veteran uh, and their family, come on down. Okay, that's a Sunday, it's at 12 noon, we'll start and then uh, we'll feed you lunch and then maybe around 1, 1.30 we'll go through and we'll do our tour and a short ceremony. But I appreciate it again, let everybody know it's not just for the Vietnam veterans, it's for all our veterans. Okay, thank you. Just so you know, I do have a, a, a board of directors desalter meeting tomorrow. We're always running one day after council. Okay. No report at this time, Mayor, thank you. Okay, and before my report starts, I did do a go to a ribbon cutting a couple of weeks ago at the new real estate company that moved into town, uh, Nook Realty, and they're on uh, California at the little center there at Sixth in California, faces California Street. They're new in new in town. I think they've been in Riverside, but they came over here. Our vector report, the spraying continues for the mosquitoes in the area for the West Nile. And uh, we had a little bit of lull there for a while because of the weather. Now it's warming back up so they'll get busy again. And then vector buys two new trucks at a time about twice a year. This time it was they bought them from Hamburg Ford. So that's good. They're spending money in our town. RTA, the ridership is up, and uh, they got some consultants working uh, on a study because by 2040, every bus in the state has to be switched over to either electric or hydrofuel cells. Very expensive deal. This was quite a presentation last week at the board meeting, and we're going to finish it up at the next board meeting but uh, those buses range a million dollars plus to buy them and they've got to have them uh, replaced uh, by 2040 so it's it's going to be a long drawn out affair and everything getting them some of the some of the buses in the area have already switched over to the hydrofuel cells and some are switching over to electric but the electric ones don't run very long we've got some long routes that uh, the electric buses wouldn't make but about half of the route so they'd have to park one over there that was charged and switch the passengers and and uh, leave this one to be charged so they're talking about going to the hydrofuel cells but that's still quite a ways off Next. Uh. Oh, this, uh, the RTA, this is just for your information, kind of interesting deal. The staff works 221 shifts per day, which equals 1,903.1 hours per day. They have a... a software that figures out all these shifts and the driver times and everything like that because there's no way that they could do that by hand anymore. 
RCTC. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to go to ribbon cutting out here at the 15 freeway in Cahalco, right in the south part of Corona, because they're just redone that whole interchange out there. I hadn't been out that way in a couple of months. It'll be interesting to see how it how it turned out. But uh, that's tomorrow at three if anybody wants to go out. And uh, the 15 freeway is the construction moving right along and uh, two new lanes each direction will be opening soon. They're already putting up the signage if you'll notice coming from the 60 freeway down this way they've got some of the sign poles up and and they're putting the rest of them up so they'll be opening that sometime this year and probably the toll roads will go into effect then also and uh, I'm going to give a little report on art right quick too Matt well yesterday as you know we had the great Norco smoke out but uh, we had uh, one one of our NART members had his trailer down there hauling horses. Ted and I went uh, went down to the base uh, command post and talked to the lieutenant and Chief Vike. Then we went back over on uh, Gruya and Pinto over there to help move horses around, and they were moving. It was a mess. Traffic was a mess. Lieutenant's people were pulling their hair out because people don't pay any attention to anybody with any authority anymore but uh, they did a good job they got the horses out Corinne went up to uh, uh, Ingalls Park and, and then Ted and I came back up there later we had uh, 46 horses Corinne 48 by the end of the day and uh, they were People were taking them all over town to different places, which was was fine. And uh, everything they got them out of there, no no horses were injured that I heard of. I know none of the bunch that we had up there were injured. And uh, it was a good day for the animals. And Corinne had got rid of all of her horses by eight o'clock last night. Everybody picked them up and took them home, so it was a good deal. And uh, always uh, worry about it. well I don't worry about it it's just a way of life in Norco with all the fine people we have that are volunteers because the minute people see smoke they start loading up hooking their trailers up and driving to the area and everything and it's total chaos but they do get get the job done so when it calms down it's nice for everybody <laughs> thank you Next item on the agenda is the City Council consent items. All items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and may be enacted by one motion. Prior to the motion to consider any action by the Council, any public comments on any of the consent item, items will be heard. There will be no separate action unless members of the Council or the audience request specific items be removed from the consent calendar. Items removed from the consent calendar will be separately considered under item number three on the agenda. So does anybody up here need to pull an item? Move to approve. Second. Well, we need to ask about cards first. There, no speaker there cards. No speaker okay, cards. Robin, you've made a motion. Yes, move to cut. Move to approve. Motion and a second to approve. Uh, please vote. Motion passes unanimous. It passes 5-0. Item uh, four is public comments. This is the time when persons in the audience wishing to address the city council regarding matters not on the agenda may speak. Please complete the speaker card in the back of the room and present it to the city clerk so you may be recognized. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits the city council's ability to respond to comments on non-agendized matters at the time such comments are made. 
The City Council shall not discuss or take action relative to any general public comment. Do we have any speaker cards? Yes, first speaker card is Kathleen Owens. And by the way, you have three minutes, the clock will ding at three minutes and we'll stop and move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Hello. Um, I, my name is Kathleen Owens. I live at 5133 California. We were part of the evacuation yesterday, so I do want to give a major thank you, kudos to my first responders. You guys did amazing. We got all the animals out. We got all the people out, and the headache was the first I've ever experienced in my life, so it was less of a headache than I wanted. <coughs> um, with that being said, um, on my street alone, California, Grula, Pinto, we have had a rash of crime. In the last three weeks, I'm not sure what's happened, but it's, it's spiked tremendously since I've been there. I've been there about two or three years, and it's making it very uncomfortable. I myself am a police officer for LAPD. I work in Central Division. I work in Skid Row, so I'm very aware of the politics of the homeless encampments and the homeless people. I know we have more politics in LA than probably down here, but I am very aware that it is a difficult situation to clean up. With that being said, um, just in the last three weeks, we've had two bikes, one quad, one dirt bike, numerous car break-ins, and I believe two vehicle thefts. Uh, one of those thefts was a gun that was left in a car. We, my neighborhood, we all talk, we all communicate, and we all watch our ring videos in the middle of the night just to see who goes by our house now. That gentleman that stole the gun decided to use our neighbor's front porch swing, which is directly in front of her bedroom window, as a swing. Played on there for about 10, 5 to 10 minutes. Um, so that's disconcerting that they don't even blatantly care. We're not getting extra patrol. We're asking for it. I myself have emailed you, sir. I've also emailed you, sir. Um, Again, I got a response. Thank you very much for that response. I do appreciate it. But other than that, I haven't seen an uptake in any patrol or anything like that. We do watch our ring videos at night to make sure that we might get extra patrol or see a patrol car go by, but we don't. Um, we've seen an influx of river homeless people coming up. Our kids play outside. Our kids use that tire string. Our kids play in the street. And we're seeing homeless walking by our street. One guy stands in front of our houses and talks to himself. Another lady walks up and down the street smoking a cigarette, carrying a suitcase. I work 10 to 12 hour days. I work in LA, so my commute's two hours each way. The last thing I want to worry about is that my elderly mother's at home with my two children, and this is what's coming on our street, and I'm not seeing anything done about it. So that's my concern about that. Um, I've offered my home for any kind of public meetings that want to be held with our neighborhood. I'm more than welcome to have anybody come down, speak with my neighborhood, give pointers, give tips, drive around, add more lights, do whatever they got to do. My neighbors are more than willing to, to accommodate these things. Um, we do have a Facebook group, so we all do talk, we all do communicate. We do have block parties at my house, um, so we are very well intertwined in our neighborhood. Um, I would just like to see more enforcement on my neighborhood, more enforcement in the river, I know the last one that I saw a news article with was 2018. Um, it's been getting worse. We ride down there, our kids play down there, I run down there, and I see the encampments and the homeless people blatantly. They just, they have no regard. So that's okay. the speech. Thank you very much for listening. We're Thank not you. supposed to answer you, but if you'll talk to the lieutenant here at the end of the meeting. Yes, sir. I will. Appreciate it. Thank and you. I appreciate your email. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Bonnie Slager. <coughs> Good evening. I just want to remind everybody that our casino night, our fundraiser for high school scholarships is not this Saturday, next Saturday, the 14th, so I hope to see everybody there. And I also would like to extend my thank you for everybody for yesterday. I know it was a tough day. And did good. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Next speaker, please. Is Amy Johnson. OK, 
Katie's much taller than I am. <laughs> um, Katie's my neighbor, and she said actually mostly things that I was going to say. I'm sorry. I'm Amy Johnson. I live at 5093 California. It's five houses from Grula, so we were a part of the evacuation yesterday. I'm going to try not to get emotional about it. Um, Katie just left to pick up my daughter at On Point Dance uh, so that I could have this short time. But there's not much to say because Katie said it. I am the person with the swing. I had a man come in my yard on my tree swinging in the middle of the night and it's not a major crime. I have had my car broken into. My other next door neighbor had their truck stolen a year ago. But like she said, the people have no regard for our bright lights, our cameras, and it is dis um, concerning. I've lived there for five years and it's increased exponentially. Um, the fire yesterday, that was terrifying. Thankfully, because we have such an amazing neighborhood and such an amazing community, all of our horses did get out, and I cannot thank Cal Fire enough. I have the utmost respect for you. My brother works for Cal Fire, and I am so thankful to the sheriff and all the responders. You guys saved our homes, but that fire didn't need to happen. There's homeless people living there outside of community doing what they want to do and I know it's a tricky situation because Norco can't necessarily regulate you know we understand how the riverbed is regulated by BLM and whatnot so I understand that however this is too close to home this is very disheartening and like Katie said uh, we haven't seen much response and so I'm hoping that in the near future we do and I'm hoping that this gets addressed and we're here right now it's not convenient but it was very entertaining thank you <laughs> thank you for uh, a very nice um, speech earlier it was, it was very nice and thank you for all your hard work um, however this is important because we're in this little corner of Norco and it's just getting invaded so I um, do hope that, you know, like Katie had mentioned, something does happen in the um, not so far off future um, because this is very serious. And I thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you. Next speaker. <laughs> Next speaker, Terry Young. Hello, I live at 4255 Temescal Avenue. Um, Yesterday was a crazy day, and of uh, the responders, CAL FIRE, amazing, incredible. My daughter was one of the many uh, children that was evacuated from Riverview Elementary, and I arrived there just before the evacuation took place, so I was kind of caught up in the chaos of it all. My car got blocked, so I was able to watch the staff, the teachers, um, everybody under extraordinary search situation, the, the smoke in the sky, the wind, helicopters flying over. I mean, it was crazy for these young children. To, to go through and the staff the teachers handled it beautifully I, it was amazing to watch in the midst of chaos they handled everything smoothly um, getting to Norco High to pick up my daughter even the staff at Norco High everything there was it looked like chaos but they handled everything beautifully and I would hope that um, the the teachers and the staff at Riverview Elementary uh, the district and Norco High do get recognized for the efforts that they did um, it it was exemplary of the way Riverview handled it, so I'd like to thank that. Um, along with that, and along with all the chaos, one of the things that it concerns me, and, and even though it is still um, under investigation, we still don't know the cause of the fire, perhaps you guys do, um, if this was a homeless person that started this fire, how would that feel knowing that these people's homes were destroyed or people's properties were destroyed or possibly animals could have been hurt because of the homeless encampments that are down on the riverbed that we're not dealing with. So what I would like to ask as a city, what can we do as a community to finally once and for all deal with these homeless people? And it's not just along the riverbed. I mean, the people in town are tired of seeing these people in town as well, leaving their trash everywhere, destroying our community. And the thing is, is that yesterday was hit too close to home, seeing these people almost lose their homes because of what probably came from these homeless people. So so my concern is, what can we do? Let's is there are can we reach out to nonprofit companies? Can we reach out to charities? Can we do what can we do? Partnering with 
other other tools that are out there that can help us solve this homeless crisis that we have. I mean, the homeless is an issue everywhere all over Southern California. We know that. But let's just take, protect our little slice of heaven here. I mean, the, this community is amazing. As you know, yesterday, people pulling their horse trailers, people offering spare stalls, doing whatever they could do to help out. That's what makes this community amazing. So let's protect our own. Let's figure out a solution, even within our borders, how we could help and solve this, this homeless crisis. And I would really love to be able to see it done using charities, using people that, um, even donations that we can offer. So just, so that way it doesn't come from public funds. I would, I am a big fan of using um, the charities that are out there. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Susan Olmstead bowen Um, good evening. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the RTRP because here's a perfect example. Uh, the, we almost burnt down in that corner of our city. And are we going to put the high voltage power lines right along that corridor so that it can burn down again? The other thing is the um, ratepayer advocate has said the city of Riverside isn't even going to pay for those lines. So the ratepayers, including us, we're going to put up power lines that are going to endanger ourselves. We have to pay for those. So I'm really, really against the RTRP and the high voltage power lines being above ground. Why would you put a reliability project in an unreliable area? It doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. Making us pay for our own danger, things that are dangerous to us, is horrible. It doesn't even make sense. So it's, it's like crazy talk. It's like the world's gone crazy. So I really, really hope that the city continues to protest against the RTRP and keeps the high voltage power lines out of that Hidden Valley area. Thank you. <coughs> Next speaker, Corinne Holder. I'm, the I'm out of time already. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm just going to hear about NART. Um, I just wanted to, from myself being part of NART um, and everything that happened yesterday, there's a lot of people that kind of get lost down in the way. Um, a lot of people get thanked, but I always appreciate it. You guys talked a lot about it today with Chief Lane, but um, early uh, when the fire first started, I was able to talk to NART members. Um, um, Hannah and Hoffman, we had a couple of conversations. We knew we needed to get the Sheriff's Department down there and make sure that the streets, because we knew in that, why do the fires always happen where we do not have good access? I don't know. Um, but we knew that the streets were going to be a problem. We knew traffic was going to be a problem. Um, Berwin was able to call and say, guys, we're going to need some help on this. And the communication, and people don't know that, the communication that happens between NART members, between the staff at the city, um, everyone came up to check on us at the end of the day. So we've got animals up at Ingalls Park. That takes Patty Ireland. It takes Brian Petrie, who was calling me early. Um, Chief came up and checked on us at the end of the day after he had all of his meetings. Came up, hey, how's it going? Looks good. Um, the communication that has to go on for all of these things to take place, all of the staff that has to get involved, everybody did just an amazing job. Everything, when I got up there with park staff, we had a new staff member, Todd, um, who you got to meet earlier, and uh, Melvin was promoted. This is not his normal job. You know, he would do something else in a time of crisis like this. And every single thing that I asked for, yep, yes, ma'am, getting it done. How can I help you? What can I do for you today? And so all of the park staff, amazing. Um, Todd got a real eye opener, I'm sure. Melvin had a good time. He was up there cheery as always, smiling. Anything I can get for you, I will get. So um, even the regular staff members that are working up there, there's a, there's a new guy. Not Richard. Maybe it was Brandon. But yeah, everybody was great. I need. Our worker. 
That was a core he was worker. A core worker. <laughs> he was like, yeah, yeah. He was super yes. nice. I know, but you know, hi, I need duct tape. Yep, I'll, they're back in two <coughs> minutes. There's your duct tape. But yeah, so <coughs> the things that go on behind the scenes, I just want to say thank you to all of you for the support that you give, and for just being out there in the community, taking your time to be out there. Um, I had my security guard over here, Mr. Newton. Um, everybody came and did what they could do to help out and I just really appreciate it. So thank you and congratulations for working so hard and getting it done and keeping everyone safe. Thanks. Thank you. There are no more speaker cards. Okay, thank you. Okay, next item is uh, item five. Legislative matters. Uh, no new evidence will be heard from the public as the public hearing has been closed regarding the items. This is ordinance number 1057, second reading. Is that yours to read, John, or mine? No, just need a motion. Need a motion? Motion approved. Have a motion and a second. And please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Okay, thank you. Uh, item six is a city council discussion item. Order of presentation for discussion items is staff report presentation. Council questions of staff. Public speakers in favor against neutral against are neutral. Council discussion and action. All right, item A, this is uh, the proposed purchase of Vigilant Solutions Automated License Plate Readers, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I'm here tonight with a recommendation, uh, recommended action to approve Measure R Citizen Oversight Committee's recommendation for funding of automated license plate readers for public safety use, utilizing Measure R funds. Automated license plate readers, also known as ALPRs, which I'll be referring to as ALPRs, automatically capture vehicle license plate information via fixed or mobile cameras while comparing the plate number to one or more law enforcement only databases. ALPRs enhance public safety and homeland security by providing real-time identification of stolen vehicles and vehicles owned by persons suspected of being involved in criminal activities. Additionally, ALPRs provide deputies with detailed records of vehicle sightings, substantially enhancing the investigative capacity of law enforcement personnel in crimes with partial or full vehicle descriptions. Vigilant Solutions leads the industry with over thousands of law enforcement agencies for over 10 years. Currently, Vigilant is used by our department and other departments in Riverside, Los Angeles, Orange, and San Bernardino counties. Vigilant Solutions is about protecting officers, families, and communities. Vigilant is about saving lives, creating innovative and essential intelligent solutions for law enforcement that enhance policing efforts. Intelligence can solve crimes, prevent crimes before they occur, and improve safety for officers and the public that they serve. Vigilant solutions are designed to collect, organize, and share data to only law enforcement personnel, making intelligence readily accessible and easy to use. License plate reader technology has helped solve literally thousands of crimes, including planned terrorist attacks, child abductions, human trafficking, narcotics trafficking, rapes, homicides, and just about any other type of offense you can imagine. Technology is increasingly being used as a force multiplier to help law enforcement agencies. Everyday law enforcement agencies are asked to do more with less, to be prepared and to be readily produce investigative leads. 
This system features a rugged and compact dual lens infrared and color license plate reader camera engineered for extreme conditions. The camera recognizes license plates in the camera's field of view, matches against various agency hot lists, and notifies law enforcement of matches. These cameras are mounted on existing traffic poles in conjunction with public works. The system can also stream live video to a separate location such as a video management system. The unique feature in is the target alert service which allows for alerts from fixed camera vehicle sightings to be broadcast from the LEARN to any computer or mobile device. LEARN software is hosted at a highly secure data center in Virginia and is limited to law enforcement use only. It features a variety of date protection standards, data, I'm sorry, data protection standards such as the Criminal Justice Information <coughs> Services, known as CGIS, compliant access controls, case level auditing, and account management at the agency level. Because the data is hosted, the data is never replicated, copied, or sold, and the agency, the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, in complete, is in complete control of its data and preserving the integrity of the department's data retention policy. Deputies would be able to accelerate investigations with real-time alerts with the placement of vigilance fixed license plate readers in strategic locations in our community to create what's called a virtual fence of highly traveled locations in and out of the city to, prevent, to pro actively prevent crimes and improve, improve safety. Alper's <coughs> cameras add investigative power and enhance safety without increasing manpower. Deputies can get more information for the criminal cases they investigate. Our deputies are able to conduct the follow-up in their cases to allow for a successful and quick resolution to that case. The request for funding of 10 fix XD high-definition Alper cameras and hardware is $167,000. This is for the purchase of the equipment, the five-year warranty, and the five years of hosting fees. Before you use a high-resolution map to give a brief overview of our city, the map highlights high-traveled entry and exit points of our city, which would help create a geofence. Although there are many other areas, these were highlighted by our staff based off trends they have investigated. The new locations have one to multiple cameras to capture the lanes of travel. These locations are Crestview in North, Norco Hills in Hidden Valley, 6th Street in Sierra, Hamner in Hidden Valley, Cordon in River, 2nd in River, and also there are existing Alper locations at Hamner and Citrus as well as, well as Archibald in River just north of the bridge. Those cameras that are existing there at the top of the map were purchased by the City of Eastville roughly 2018-2019. The new locations are tentative locations listed above and may have multiple cameras at the intersection to determine the best lane of travel to capture the license plates. The new locations would equate to the 10 cameras. In 2016, with the passage of SB 34 regarding ALPERS, our department has closely followed the parameters of the laws established. This was done through department directives and most recently in 2019 through our new policy manual by Lexapol under policy 412. This new policy now supersedes those d department directives. The Riverside County Sheriff's Department policy provides for the storage and usage of digital data obtained through the ALPERS technology. Electronic data gathered during ALPERS usage is the property of the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. There are safeguards regarding access to and the use of stored data by department members. ALPERS data may be shared only with law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies for official law enforcement purposes or as permitted by law. The department does provide training to deputies who are authorized to use and access the ALPERS system, and ALPERS records are retained by the department with safeguards and purged records according to applicable laws and policies. With ALPERS technology, our deputies have been able to quickly solve several crimes. 
Those have included robberies, burglaries, and tra trailer thefts, to just to name a few in the last year here in the city of Norco. With that, I thank you, Mayor and City Council, and I will be able to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, Council have any uh, questions? I'll start. Um, in your the form, the uh, 412, the policy that you, you provided to us, um, it states under there under section 412.3.2 public hearing before implementing the current ALPR program with the county of the Riverside County, the department invited the public opinion on a matter during an open meeting of the Riverside County Board of Supervisors in late 2017. Are you familiar with that, the form 11 or the minutes of that meeting? Yes. Okay. So I will give you the, this is what was approved. This is why my, my conscience is it is that allow the public comments on the sheriff's operation of the LA, L, ALPR program within the unincorporated service areas as per the code, civil code. That's what that thing, that's what your 412 goes. You're only approving the comments in, I mean the use of this in the unincorporated area. It doesn't say for a contract city. So just, and I, my, my question on it is, when the Measure R committee was asked to approve this, were they aware that there's been, it should have been some public comments section on that? Well, per the civil code, any public agency that operates or intends to operate the Alpers shall provide an opportunity for public comment at any regular scheduled public meeting, which would allow for anybody at the Measure R COC to make public comment on the Alper system. But what I'm getting at is even the, our own county board of supervisors, an action that you are alluded to in your in 412, it only applies to the unincorporated area. This in, and let me go through this, in, in that, as far as with what was submitted as part of the, of that form 11, which is the minutes for that meeting, contract city partners who have purchased ALRP devices for use within their cities shall also allow for public comment at their regularly scheduled city council meetings. To my knowledge, even to approach on the Measure R committee, was this ever done? If you look at the civil code, the civil code doesn't specifically state any city council meeting. It's any public meeting open for public comment. Well, I understand the civil code. This is what the Board of Supervisors and you're referring to. But we'll get that because that's a legal matter as we go through. I'm just pointing it out what your co says because even the directive that was approved the sheriff's directive and i know this has all been superseded in the department directive of 2018 it's still incorporate it's still included that un the contract cities had to hold their own hearings and i don't know if you're aware of that i have it so i just that was on your website even though you just changed the website but we'll get to that In the Measure R, and this went to the Measure R Committee. It is, has never been before our council before, the use of the ALPRs. The Measure R Committee was these, uh, the four and a half million dollars, and this is right from our own webpage, by the way. Allows Norco to invest in infrastructure and vital services. Measure R allows Norco to preserve its quality of life, restore deteriorating streets, trails, parks, facilities, and equestrian amenities while preventing additional cuts to Norco's public safety services and the safe levels of sheriff and fire protections can be maintained without risking emergency response times. That's what Measure R come, came from. In 2018, when this council went through and put this thing together, we talked about infrastructure and the need for, even prior to that, 
when the infrastructure subcommittee came through, we talked about different things in the city that we needed to do in the ad hoc committee. As far as this program, to me, this is a capital improvement fund request that should have been made, even if you had made it at mid-year budget or uh, gone through in our budget process and requested it. This went right directly to the Measure R committee without coming to this council first. And having an ability for us, even if we wanted to have at least a public meeting to where the citizens would have a chance to say if we wanted or not. Um, that was when the city of Eastvale approved theirs. They actually had two public meetings. One before they actually did on their uh, CIP request or their uh, public works, I'm not, yeah, CIP request to have the first uh, ALPR's user city and then at their final, when they did the final approval with their uh, Vigilant Solutions uh, contract approval, they had a second one. But as the Measure R committee, you know, this is what we approved last year. We approved half a million dollars for trail, trail fence, street projects, a million and a half, city roof, uh, 805,000, 204,000 for city hall improvements, swamp cooler replacements, you know, 295 for parking lot projects, ADA assessments, 3,000, and 168 for Ridge River Trail projects. The council, you know, adamantly were about making sure these infrastructure projects are done. I just don't think that it should have gone to the Measure R committee without at least being talked about for us first. Um, and then you talk about, the residents there talked about crime. And I know the importance of surveillance and surveillance equipment. When I first joined the department, I went around with a VHF radio. We had three channels. I was on the Tri-Station, and I shared it with the Hemet, Elsinore, and Banny. We didn't have any toys. I was in a Dodge Diplomat, okay? Since then, MDTs, MDCs came through, onboard computers, GPS locators, uh, low jack, they all came. All these toys. It's great. But what has happened, and this goes back to what the residents have said earlier, there's no punishment. And I'm doing that, and then people ask, well, why do we have these things, and why do we want to invest the money? I want to catch criminals, too. I want to put them in jail. But tell me if I'm wrong that a burglary conviction today, what do they get? I mean, just I, I, I have it, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to draw it. That I'll, they get nothing. Felony, formal probation, car theft, probation. This is from the uh, the own legal report from the defense attorney's thing, by the way. 17B of the penal code has been misused so much because of Prop 47 and AB 109. That's why there's a crime problem. That's why I don't mind investing money into the surveillance program, but I also look at a return of investment on this. So uh, I'm all for crime fighting, but what I'm looking at is how this thing was put together for us and how we couldn't have done it in another, uh, when we do our budget thing myself. Um, so that, and the one thing you talked about, the data, the retention time, how long is it kept? So the retention is kept for two years. Two years, okay, that's not too bad. Final question, what happens after five years? So after five years, the warranty on the equipment expires, but the equipment will still run if it's functional. If it's not functional, then the equipment is out of warranty and then the equipment would be have to be replaced as needed. And who picks up that cost? 
So that would be something that we would have to uh, work with the city manager and determine how we would uh, fund that. Okay, so this is just a five-year program, anything like that. And any breaches in the security of this program? No, the all the information is kept on a CGIS uh, server in Virginia, which is monitored by the FBI and Homeland Security. So it's one of your highest level of uh, data uh, retention services. Okay, all right, uh, that's enough right now. Thank you, Mayor. Kevin? Uh, not right now. Robin? I just have a couple questions. Lieutenant, um, it talks about when the license plates go through, they're going to ping automatically. So is that going to all of your deputies that are on duty right then? And then let's say the set team is working on something. How long does it take for them to access that information? Can you give me some idea about those? Sure. When when the license plate is read and it, it's read through to the law enforcement databases, if it is um, either reported stolen or wanted, then it immediately it immediately creates an alert. That alert would go to dispatch, which dispatch would provide the location of the camera where it alerted and the direction of travel. So that's broadcast to all the deputies real time. So they would have a, a general idea to go to that specific area with the description of the vehicle that they're looking for. Looking at the staffing levels in Norco, and again, I don't know what a typical day is. Let's say they got that alert. What is the likelihood that they would be able to respond in real time and not be you know, hung up on some other event or something going on? With the current technology that we're using off of the Eastfield cameras, um, when we receive alerts, we have a deputy available um, on each of those alerts. Um, if there is a critical incident, such as the fire that we dealt with yesterday, then yes, those alerts would go uh, beyond our, you know, um, capabilities to handle that because we wouldn't be in that immediate area because we're dealing with a critical incident. But on a daily basis, you will have enough personnel to respond or break away to respond to receive those alerts. Okay, thank you. That's all I have right now. Greg? I think Robin swapped it out on me. Um, I did. Your uh, uh, report, uh, it listed hosting fees. So at five years, explain what the hosting fees are. And, so the, and the, what sure, sorry, go ahead. related cost. The hosting fee is related to the retention of the data that's going to the learn server. So when the camera is capturing that image, those images, those are covering the fees of that data being transferred to the CGIS uh, information bank. And and, but that ends in five years. Correct. Okay, and. Uh, with the East Vale cameras, you, you gave topics of crime prevention. Do you have actual stats of what East Vale or the, the Sheriff's Department has been able to accomplish in the, has it been two years with the cameras now or a year and a half maybe? So within last year, um, I don't have a specific number because I can't give you a specific number because of the case closure. If the case isn't closed, it's still pending. With case closures, I'll give you a couple of high priority incidents that were reported through press releases. One of them being a daytime burglary off of North um, in Shadow Canyon area, um, where we were able to utilize those cameras and detect a license plate to lead us to a residence outside of our city. Um, also, we utilize it for uh, trailer theft that recently occurred, which led us to an area in Ontario and Chino. 
Um, and we have other cases that we continually monitor it, um, especially with the, the daytime burglaries. Um, any partial information of license plates or full license plates that people capture off of cameras or first-hand knowledge, um, we can utilize those cameras and that learn system to detect where these cars are um, essentially pinging off of in certain areas. Um, here in Norco, I could tell you our, our, our deputies use this technology on a daily basis. Um, any possible lead, they immediately go into learn and try to obtain that information. Because with a complete license plate, you can now obtain who the registered owner is, and that gives you that lead to go contact that person. Is the city of Corona? Have this system also? So, last I know is Corona is in the works right now to utilize that. Um, the agencies that are around us that are currently utilizing it, besides the city of Eastville, uh, you have the city of Chino, Ontario, um, you have uh, San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. So, you have a uh, nexus right around Norco that are currently use, uh, utilizing the uh, Alpers okay. system. That's all I have for now. I have additional comments under discussion later. Okay, uh, we'll go to the public speakers right now. Do we have any cards? Yes, the first speaker is Linda Dixon. Good evening. I know this is something that hopefully would uh, prevent crime in our area or at least uh, catch a few bad guys, but this is above my pay grade, so I'd leave that up to you. Uh, I'm speaking uh, as uh, a member of the community who work very, very hard for Measure Our Funds. and. Um, uh, I'm going to agree with uh, Councilman Hoffman that this is not something that Measure R funds is designated for. Um, I know what backwards and forwards every single word that we voted on and uh, this is the uh, excellent use of capital improvement funds. Um, this could be incorporated uh, uh, with this upcoming budget and I don't think I would oppose that. But as far as Measure R funds, this is not at all what this was intended. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Is Corinne Holder. Evening again. Um, so when I first read about this project, um, and I did go to the Measure R meeting, and I don't know if you guys have those minutes already, um, but I did express a couple of concerns. Um, the first one is, again, is this the proper use of Measure R money? Um, but my first, my second real question, I had to kind of go back and look through it, was, was this the proper process for it to go to Measure R or for it to come to council and be approved? Um, in my opinion, when we're, and we talked about this with adding deputies, um, there's a service contract, there could be legal issues, there could be liability issues. Um, we've, uh, you know, my husband's in law enforcement. Um, red light camera, they had huge issues with liability, always having to go to court. He was like an expert witness, yay for him. Um, but <laughs> it kind of goes back to there's a lot of questions, and I did feel that that is something that needed to come to council first. And it is not measure our committee's job to do that kind of homework, to field those kind of questions. It should be presented to them. This is what we've decided as a council. Um, these are, this is a great opportunity. Whatever your questions and concerns are, those are already met and their job is to say yes or no to the expenditure not to field all the homework and do that part of the job. That's your job. Can it be construed as a good expenditure for Measure R? Maybe. It will help our law enforcement, so that could help us maintain our officers with the same budget, give us a little bit of extra stuff, and 
without having to hire another law enforcement officer. So that kind of, I'm a little here or there on that one. Um, is it a good project? I think it is. is. At the end of the day, I think it could be a good project if you decide that you don't feel that it's proper use of measure or money. Um, I would like to see it come back in July and maybe be looked at as part of the regular budget. Um, I'm a little neutral on the um, is it a good measure or expenditure. I was more concerned about the process of how it got there. Thank you. Next speaker is Susan Olmsted Bowen. Good evening. Um, all I, as the chair of the Measure Art Committee, I want to say I gave it a lot of thought as to whether this was good use of these funds, and I think that with Prop 47 and whatever the other AB is, our crime has gone up. I live on Shadow Canyon. We had uh, someone broke in when they, people were home. Um, and by the way, thank you, Lieutenant Ilya, for sending your deputies. We had a neighborhood watch. I will tell you the 100 homes that are around Shadow Canyon, down Sunset, and Narco Drive support this project and support this use of Measure R. I did give it a lot of thought, and I think it's maintaining our public safety. I think that it's a good use of these funds, and it's a five-year investment. So it's 33000 a year. And at the end of the five years, there'll be new technology, so they're going to be ripped out anyway, and something else is going to be put in, in my opinion. So I would hope that you vote for this project and that we get these cameras in. They have been very helpful with solving crimes in our city. And how scary is it to wake up and find someone in your guest bedroom robbing you? And that happened across the street from me. So I hope you do approve these. Thank you. The last speaker card, Daryl Crary. Mayor and Council Members Daryl Cravey. Um, <clears throat> I too support this measure uh, using Measure R money uh, because it's for me it's all about public safety and we have al already approved some money through Measure R for public safety having to do with uh, with traffic flow uh, so it's not it's not that it's a uh, uh, a new ground even. So again, thank you for your time. There are no further speaker cards. Okay, I'll bring it back to council. Greg, you want to start this time? Uh, thank you. Um, Lieutenant, I'd like to all, you know, always I think you have my support and the support of council and the residents uh, I think that should go without stand uh, without uh, any further statement um, it's another tool in the toolbox and I understand that also um, it, it, as far as what was discussed earlier um, as far as penalties for other crimes and things like that um, that's not your purview it's up to all of us to change the laws and 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 have penalties you know associated with it so um, yeah like with a vehicle theft well nothing's gonna happen to the little thief but at least I'll get my vehicle back and have to pay for a new transmission and stuff like that but um, so there, there probably is some benefit to this even though it has nothing to do with penalties the, the problem I'm having w w with this is that part of its process and with 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 the measure our fun funding that and and trying to understand the way both sides um, I can't make the nexus the way I read measure R, interpreted measure R funding that those funds should be used uh, uh, for this purchase. What I'd like to recommend is that um, 
and, and that's why I'm going to vote no on this. But I'd like to see it brought back, if, unless it gets approved, um, in July, because I think I would support it as a capital improvement um, project, but not as a measure our project. Thank you, Mayor. Robin. And I guess this might be a question for John, but um, Council Member Hoffman brought up the public hearing requirements. Mm -hmm. And what is your professional opinion on how that is yeah, interpreted through a citizen's oversight or or even this meeting we're having now? Yeah, I mean, my, my concern is, and I've expressed this uh, before, the the requ apparent requirement in the, the action of the Board of Supervisors to require a public hearing at the City Council. Uh, and I think that that needs to be done. That's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily preclude it, an action on the item tonight because they're really two separate things. One's essentially a funding, the other is whether or not even if, even if you decided that it was appropriate for Major R, whether or not before you uh, enacted it, you needed to have the public hearing. Uh, uh, so I guess the bottom line for me is assuming that the, the recitation of the uh, guidelines uh, adopted by the supervisors is accurate, that it would appear that the supervisors uh, it before it could be used, would like to have uh, cities at a city council meeting uh, take public input. So I'm going to go along with my colleagues then that it's a process issue at this point in time or the order in which we're um, doing things. Can, can I yeah. comment on that? Yeah. I want to speak to the process. Uh, first of all, with respect to uh, Sheriff's Department Policy 412. Um, the recommendation is for any contract city wishing to implement a LPR uh, to have it at a regularly scheduled city council meeting where members of the public can provide comments. That's precisely what we are doing here today. There is no change in that. Uh, there is no requirement that you have a published in the newspaper of a public hearing before that input takes place. So I think we've met that requirement clearly, in my opinion. Secondly, with respect to Measure R process, everything we've done with Measure R, as far as the approval process, starts with staff. Staff initiates the pro programs or recommends the program, identifies the programs and our projects uh, to be funded with Measure R and takes it to the Citizens Oversight Committee. The Citizens Oversight Committee reviews that and makes, asks questions and uh, approves or disapproves uh, the project. Once the project is approved, it's brought to the City Council for approval. The same thing we are doing with this. The same as we have done with many other projects that have been approved under Measure R through the Citizens Oversight Committee. Um, with respect to what Isvel process was, um, Isvel may have had two public meetings on this, so that's their choice, it's not a requirement. Um, again, whether this is uh, included in a capital improvement project or Measure R, all items that we have, most of the items we have funded out of Measure R are in fact capital improvement projects. This is an item that is public safety in nature, clearly part of the intent of Measure R without a doubt. Uh, this is an infrastructure that helps the uh, public safety to perform their duties. Now, I'm not passing a value judgment as to whether this is the appropriate expenditure, whether the value is met, but in terms of the process, we have exactly followed the process that is required under policy 412 of the Sheriff's Department. I think we followed the same process we have followed with respect to approving any other projects through Measure R. And in my mind, somebody who worked and initiated the revenue measure, there is no doubt that this is an appropriate expenditure of Measure R, and that is my opinion. Um, again, 
That doesn't mean the city council gets to approve this project or gets to deny it, but I do want to make sure that the facts are clearly laid out. All right. So now I have conflicting information. That's my favorite. Um, so. And if, if you'd like one additional comment. Yeah. I, Andy is correct in that there doesn't need to, there isn't required even by the uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, guidelines that there be a notice public hearing. I mean, that is not what it says. I feel would have felt much more comfortable if the uh, item on this agenda was approve the program and the expenditure, uh, which would solicit input into th whether or not the program should be adopted as opposed to simply the funding. Right. Uh, and th that that that's the difficulty that I have, uh, but otherwise I agree with everything that Andy said. I right, and I and I agree with you, John. I think it's two separate discussions. Number one, do we want those cameras and in town, which is one discussion, and then the second part is the funding. And I think we're looking today at the way it's presented here is an approval of funding, and not. Which is fine, yeah. right? Because I don't see any distinction with respect to everything that the city purchases. When we award a contract for purchase of equipment, um, that is uh, an approval that we do in fact want to purchase that equipment. Um, and, and, and in doing this project here tonight, uh, if the city council approves it, it is, uh, is an indication on the city council that, in fact, this is a program that they are, are, are approving. Um, if the city council obviously decides we need to take this to another city process or city hall, city town hall meeting to get a, approval uh, before uh, a funding is made, um, staff will do that. But all I'm pointing out is uh, we don't go through separate processes of approving uh, a, uh, a purchase of an equipment as an example, a city vehicle, uh, aside from uh, and then come back with a funding uh, that's they are generally done at the same at the same point um, now the, other, the only thing I see here that would need to come back as a follow-up if this project is approved is uh, formally uh, the award of a contract uh, but uh, this is a request to approve uh, uh, this the funding for this program and by so doing I think the program is uh, invariably approved so if I can explain my point of view then making a purchase of a vehicle versus these cameras we're dealing with privacy issues we're dealing with data security issues and I get that you know this is a top level security but the world isn't the same as it was before and then if there is a breach in security who takes the liability for that breach and all those other things so it's not like purchasing a vehicle we're looking at in my mind something that's completely different because there's so many other aspects to it so in that respect you know I would disagree with that I agree with you that if yes we say we're gonna make this expenditure we're approving the equipment and all that stuff but this isn't a, a typical vehicle purchase or anything like that and even when Eastvale was here I had those questions and I don't think you know that in my mind I have a hundred percent comfort with the answers that that I have received and so that's kind of where I'm at on on this particular issue at this time. So, so that I point out with respect to the liability issues, you know we have a, a contract with the uh, Riverside County Sheriff. Right. And under that contract, um, any liability uh, that arises out of the, uh, that contract, their performance of their duties, or any programs that they are performing on behalf of the city, uh, they own that liability. And that liability is, ten is tendered to them. And we have had many, many instances in the past uh, they entirely own that liability. I just want to point right, out. Right, but if we purchase the equipment and we're paying the hosting fees, does that liability still fall in the sheriff's department when we're the one that's paying for all of that stuff? As long as they are operating that, that, that uh, and they are maintaining and operating that equipment, yes. Yeah, and I, I think that's accurate. The, the issue then is whether this agenda item 
provides the appropriate vehicle for those kinds of discussions. Kevin? <coughs> so what kind of caught my ear was that the deputies use it every day. And we're very proud of the fact that we support our deputies. We enforce law, we, enforce, we, we support law enforcement in the city of Norco. Um, I don't want to wait till July. I just had a group of residents tell me they got people stealing stuff at other front yards. Their kids are at risk. Um, I don't, I totally want the council to be comfortable. I, Robin, your comments, all of your comments are very good. But I don't want to wait till July. So what I would recommend is that can we postpone this hearing, have a hearing at the next meeting where we discuss, literally discuss all of the questions that we have so that if we have to, if it comes out of Measure R, if it comes, I don't care where it comes from, if it's a tool that our deputies are telling us they need and can use, it's something I want to put into their hands sooner than later. We do have a surplus. We have money. We have all different kinds of pots we can pull from. Uh, again, they need help. The deputies want the tool. And I think that to wait four months is silly. What are we going to do if somebody rides on that friggin' swing and we could have caught them with that device in that deputy's hands? I don't want to take that risk. So the whole measure R argument, I mean, I, I just don't care. We have lots of money and lots of pots. So my recommendation is could we put this to our next meeting, have a public meeting, announce it, discuss it at length, talk about the liabilities, all the questions, very good questions council raised, and let's move forward with the project. That would be my recommendation. Are you making a motion? Oh. Oh, yeah. You know, I guess I'm going to go back to the process again. And it's not a public hearing, it's a public meeting. So, because the, there is a differentiation. The reason I'm so adamant about it is because we're talking about First Amendment and Fourth Amendment rights for residents. You, you know, and this is probably. It's an ACLU, ACLU paper. Take an aggregate. ALPR data can paint an immediate and intimate portrait of a driver's life in even chill First Amendment protected activity. Drivers have no control over whether their vehicles displays a license plate because the government requires all car, truck, and motorcycle drivers to display license plates in a public view. So it's particularly disturbing that automatic license plate readers are used to track and record movement of millions of old ordinary people even though the overwhelming majority are not connected to a crime. That's this part and then let me finish this up. In addition to capturing data, license plate data, photographs can reveal the image of the vehicle, the vehicle's drivers and passengers as well as its immediate surroundings. So that everybody knows what's inside of them, okay? And that's a good tool. For law enforcement, it's a great tool. The ACLU estimates that less than 2% of plates scanned are linked to criminal activity. And the reason I am adamant about the public meeting before this program, where people have an opportunity to see residents of this community, if they want this project or these this system in our town is because we do we give up a little bit of our first and fourth amendment rights by allowing these I just was on the 241 133 I knew it was a toll road I gave that up when I when I jumped on the toll road knowing they're going to take a picture of my car and I was go through and I had to pay the toll I knew that it's important that residents get an opportunity to voice their opinion. I'm kind of like, and, and I'll agree with Kevin, we already have the Measure R Oversight Committee has approved this expenditure. I don't have a problem if we can do this at the next meeting so residents have an opportunity to have, an, to come here and express pro or con 
in its implementation, implementation of this program. It's good to have a toys in your toy box. Cops love toys. They always got a new gun going. They always want the newest, latest thing going on. They love electronics. This is a crime catching thing, so that's good. But I just, was, the process bothered me of how it was done. That we, and then Andy breaks good points and John makes good points. Is that, did we need it? Do we wait until June? No. It seems like we do have any, the residents made it pretty clear. So I'm not opposed to, to doing it. I don't know how the rest of the council feels. To push this back to our next council meeting so that the residents have an opportunity to attend a public meeting and we implement it. But I also would like to see, because we didn't get, if you were through that, and I don't know if staff got this, but I'm looking at what the city of Eastville was provided with. Unbelievable. This must be about well, it's 21 pages there of a service agreement between Vigilant and then another, yeah, 21, 22 some pages of their service agreement. We didn't get that. So if we can get the rest of this put together on it, uh, the, the proper paperwork, I'm good for that, Kevin. So can you do, can you can staff do that next meeting? Have a is council something they want to do? No, we can bring back we can bring this back next week. Well, then I make a motion that I, that at the I'm next meeting we uh, we agendize this. We talk at length about it. And we can even talk about the funding sources. We'll be happy to even publish it as a public hearing if that's the city council's desire. Oh, do do whatever whatever makes council uh, comfortable with the process. It sounds like there's a lot of problem with the process. So maybe I don't know if you want to, Ted. You can talk to them about the pro whatever it takes. Well, it doesn't require a public hearing. It requires a public meeting. So the two are different. So do you want to have? Are you saying you want to have a meeting like a town hall meeting? No, no, no. A public meeting is a council meeting where people understand that we're implementing the program. So I'm making a motion that we move this to the next council meeting and we are able to discuss it at length. Under discussion, Mayor. Go ahead. Um, Andy was the. Uh, what Council Member Hoffman just brought up about this 21 page uh, uh, specifications that were presented to the residents of Eastvale, were there any, because in our report we have zero other than a, a map, um, were there any specifications or, or any additional information provided to the Measure R committee? Or did they basically get a, a one page report? They got the report and the presentation that you saw. Uh, I believe also during the presentation, Lieutenant Elia uh, read uh, information regarding the uh, the policies that apply to the operations of, <coughs> of ALPR. And the other point um, under discussion is that um, I'm going to agree to disagree with some of your comments that you made. Um, I think there, to me, it kind of still reads apples and oranges. Um, and I, I can't find, and, and I'm fine where, where Kevin's going. If you want to have an, an additional meeting, and but I'm going to stick with. I, you need another funding source. I don't care if you want to pull it out of general fund or whatever. This was not the intent of Measure Our Money. Measure Our stated that it was to to prevent cuts to public safety. We're not talking about buying vehicles. That We wouldn't even allow that under Measure R. So to make that, I don't see how you can make a nexus to saying I'm buying equipment or I'm gonna buy a vehicle with Measure R money. That would never be approved. Well, that's kind of the way I took you at it. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. So you made a motion, Kevin. I'll second it. Uh, and just just as a point, I'm assuming that we'll get contracts information, as much information as possible on the issue, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, back yeah. For actual procurement. Right. Right. We haven't done yet. Yeah. 
All right. Just one point for the discussion. In that two-week period, can we get, uh, I know we just did our mid-year budget. And it's like Councilman Newton said, can we look and see where we do have funding in our capital improvement fund to get this thing started? Uh, I know we just did everything. Lizette did a very good job. But uh, before we delve the, uh, into the Measure R fund uh, at that, if, if there's any source of that funding somewhere. Uh, if we have to use Measure R fund, I understand it. But I agree that when we did our 10-year budget plan, when we talked about the, the reason for the Measure R, it was for to make sure the public service safety levels remain the same and not to go down. Uh, we did that in our 10-year project. So I'm not a very big fan of, of buying uh, toys. I know it helps them out and helps out because it, uh, it gives them more surveillance opportunity. But if there's another fund that we can get this through, even if we have to, even if we have to unbalance our mid-year budget, I would rather see that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Please revote. Sorry, Jeez, it's a <laughs> I was imitating. Motion passes with Councilmember Newton voting no. Thank you. Next, next item on the agenda is. Uh, Council and City Manager and Staff Communications. Uh, Kevin, we'll start with you. Uh, you know, but the the, the uh, discussion from the residents and the discussion of the cameras. Um, you, uh, there were times we haven't had one in a long time. I wonder if we get like just a a public safety update, just to remind us all how many deputies we have on the street, how the shifts work, that kind of stuff. Something we can present to the public. Could we agendize that for the next meeting and maybe just. We have it uh, coming up in uh, April, April? They, the first meeting March, in April. April, yes. All right, perfect. And then also you'll have the annual report coming right, in Right, that also. I know. I just wanted, you know what, I want to let the public know what it is you're doing because you've made some significant improvements. So, but now you're going to go to California. Oh, okay, you're doing a great job. That's all. Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one of the things, and and I, I've talked to, to the deputy director about this too with the parks. You know, one of the reasons for our NART team, we were able to put those stalls up and up there quickly, is because they're on site. But I want, and this is also for the Measure R committee too. There said with Susan, just remember those most of the stalls and equipment do not belong to the city; they belong to me. So I just want you to be aware of it when you talk about infrastructure, those panels up there and that, when we talk about building stuff and putting things together, we have to think of that in the future for the stalls and the infrastructure of our park and our equipment up there. Just enough said. Thank you. Lieutenant? <laughs> Chief? No. Uh, just a quick opportunity. I want to uh, highlight the response yesterday of the fire, and I, I'm not sure, Brian, you're going to do the update, but um, I can't say enough. The coordinated response uh, for all the first responders as well as city staff uh, in the community was absolutely amazing. Um, as the incident commander and then operations chief um, with my partner here my and Chief Vike, um, Brian will highlight it. We had over 40 engines, three helicopters, uh, simultaneously uh, the bulldozers, the fire handmate, inmate fire crews, seven of those. And Brian will cover all those numbers, but uh, 
as the incident commander in, in, in operations, uh, it was well, it was very dynamic, uh, and we toured that today, and you saw the devastation. Uh, I'm so proud of our firefighters for uh, not losing any residential structures out there at all. Uh, we did have spot fires well within the city. There was one by Riverview Elementary, and that is such a distance from where the fire burned. And our partners uh, and law enforcement for my partner to get in the commander's truck and uh, I've never seen so many deputies in my life in such a short time. It was phenomenal. To the NART team, to city staff, to Brian, I texted him and said, I need Nellie Weaver for a command post. And I'm not kidding, 20 minutes later, there were tables and chairs set up with projectors. And uh, it was absolutely amazing. Chad, your staff, phenomenal. Um, Putting out storm drains for us was was amazing. Brian, you probably already know I commandeered Matt today, and we have a Matt product, and I'm proud to report I've been telling you all for two days the least acres were burned in this city. 19 acres of the city of Norco is all that burned. 122 in Harupa Valley and 38 in the county. So 19 acres here is a phenomenal success for the coordination, evacuation of horses. I was absolutely amazed at uh, Ingalls last night when I pulled in to see the operation that Coran and Nart had set up. Phenomenal. So thank you all uh, for such a small town. We are so mighty. And it's like we do this every day with all the staff. So uh, thank you to all. And that started over in Arupa Valley, right? Yes, it did. That's what I told you, the mayor today from there. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> Lizette. Lizette and Bill. Yeah, thank you. Brian. Uh, just to echo what Chief Lane said, uh, I got a chance to work pretty close with them through this the man fire, and uh, it was interesting. Um, it, they the the way they work and operate it's it's like going to war and Zulu company this way and Alpha company this way and how they tactically work together and some of the interesting statistics and in talking about which Chief Lane talked a little bit about um, but even from the coordination when they sent out direct command and the evacuation sites and trying to push them out <clears throat> and the uh, Riverside County Emergency Management department stepping in and helping with all of that this overall incident command process that is set up through the state through Cal Fire is really incredible uh, in regards to how we operate or EOC would operate to get information funneled down to every various location and I, I have to compliment all of the city staff and departments for uh, I get a message I call and they were there to make sure it happen so I, I just want to again echo that uh, the fires at 50 percent containment as of uh, six o'clock tonight um, the guys are just working through the evening to continue to mop up the fire um, what was really interesting is Cal Fire Riverside took the lead you had Cal Fire San Bernardino City of Corona Fire Department Los Angeles County Fire Department Orange County Fire Authority Riverside City Fire Department those, all of those agencies merged into our town to help protect our properties and other properties to the communities adjacent to us. <clears throat> 210 fire, uh, help firefighters, three helicopters, uh, Riverside County Sheriff's had 12 deputies, three CSOs, a lieutenant and a sergeant, and I tell you, I agree with Lieutenant uh, uh, and what, the, um, what Chief Lane said, in a matter of minutes, those guys were swarming in to help and helped Ed down there with the parking because it, it was pretty chaotic and they brought order to chaos pretty quick. San Bernardino bringing in one of their helicopters, LA County, and then our county uh, coming stepping up. Um, there were <clears throat> 40 engines. These were all master mutual aid units, so we're not going to see a bill. Luckily, let's head. So, um, so anyway, five water tenders, two dozers. Um, 
the seven fire crews, thank you, the prisons, uh, 10 command overheads, which means these are commanders coming in from all over to assist in this. Um, the EMD department had three people, plus they brought in a fiscal liaison and accounting for us because we there's grant money we're actually applying for and to get reimbursements. Um, utilities, uh, Edison, and all, obviously the gas company. AMR had two units there yesterday, just parked, ready to go. Um, the uh, public information officers, uh, our, our city public information officer networking with EMD and also Riverside County uh, Cal Fire's uh, public information officer. And again, Public Works, Parks Department, Animal Control Services, uh, Parks and Recreation, which handles all of our shelter management was on standby, they were ready to go. They had stuff loaded in cars ready to fly if we were to open anything in town. So <clears throat> from a community that is very small, and how it operates, I would dare to say very many communities around us have that efficiency. And a lot of that goes to the leadership here and the support from the council for the various departments to work on uh, providing training and also preparing for things like this, whether it be our community organizations, NARD, et cetera, or it's the internal staff. Uh, it was just a really good effort and it was a very successful one. As I think the most important thing is no injury and no structural uh, damage as far as we didn't lose any residents. So I think that's really a credit to everyone and their efforts. And uh, giving Chief Lane, he, he is he's at the very top and when, you, when he's in those meetings there's probably, I don't even know how he has to take a breath because he's got questions coming from everywhere. So, but they, he, they manage it and they do. And Chief Vike also, uh, big credit because he's right there to make sure things flow. So we have a really good team here and it's a really good team that continues to get better and better. And so I, I was really impressed with that. I, I And um, I, I just know that we're going to only get better as this goes on. We've already talked about having some debriefing meetings and then also I know uh, Ted and I and Berwin have already started talking about certain things. How do we make it better? And that's always when you have an event like this, how can you approve on it and so thank you <coughs> sorry if and that's the point I'm trying to make if there were any issues we certainly didn't know them as the commanders and uh, it was absolutely amazing I just want to thank Andy when I came here in 2015 it was Andy's uh, direction that we get an emergency op operations plan updated that we get our local hazard mitigation plan that we stand up our EOC and get everything out of the cabinets and turn that room into what it is today a war room and that we train our staff and as a result of that Andy thank you very much uh, that is a result of that direction from uh, our number one leader and that's what staff has done through the years and uh, yesterday was a testament to that so I just want to point that out. Steve? Chad? Uh, thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, I only have one item to report related to the fire. We might have one storm drain conduit that might be damaged um, at the end of Gruel in California. Uh, there is a storm drain inlet and that goes directly down and discharges into the river um, and during the fire um, it based the fire and the smoke um, used that um, open pipe as a conduit basically acting as a chimney and discharge that that hot smoke um, up at Gruel at our lift station. Um, it was very interesting to see that happen, but you can smell the burning or melting uh, plastic pipe that's underground. So we still have to go through and video that to see if it's still intact uh, or usable. Uh, but that's the only thing that we had directly impacted as far as public works. So we'll know more in the, in the next few days to a week once we get a chance to go down there and after the fire is gone and everything, and we can go down there safely and, and have that videoed. So that's the only thing that I know as far as uh, that might be impacted related to the fire. Um, and the only other item I want to inform you of is we did have two bids today for street improvement projects, um, Hamner Avenue from 3rd to Hidden Valley, Hidden Valley um, and also um, River Road um, going from Bluff to Sundance and Del Mar. Um, uh, pretty much all of Del Mar um, being redone. Both those bids came in well under the engineer's estimate and very good prices, which I'm happy to report. And we have one more project bidding tomorrow, which is a slurry seal project. Uh, both, all three of those items will come back to you at the next council meeting for approval and award. So we're excited to get those projects moving and get them done before the end of June. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Dana. 
Mr. Newton. Nothing about your knee and all that time you put in yesterday. Okay, Robin. <laughs> you need some t tissues down at Rite Aid. <laughs> Robin, nothing. John, I got one more thing. I, I told Brian this this morning talking about the fires yesterday and the great cooperation by city staff and sheriff's department and fire department but uh when my wife pointed out the smoke what right after it got started i went out and looked at it and then the wind changed and it got worse i i called melvin and i was in contact with melvin for about six or seven hours yesterday back and forth but i'm just to told brian for person that hasn't been here on staff very long and has been the the under chief of his department and to take it over in the last month or so he done one heck of a job yesterday he was all over the place and we were ted and i was all over the rest of the area and we were communicating back and forth but melvin really stepped up to the plate yesterday and can't say enough good about him so you got to be proud of him there Brian and that's all I have and uh, <coughs> huh? you already got it. okay yeah okay all right and you need to stand up a little taller <laughs> I'll do that next time <laughs> Uh, just uh, FYI, uh, at your last city council meeting, you directed staff uh, to write a letter to California Public Utilities Commission uh, regarding the RTRP project. Just want to let everybody know that letter did go out uh, to CPUC. You also directed that a letter be written to the governor. Uh, that letter is in your red folder to be signed, and hopefully we'll get that out tomorrow. Good. Okay, with all that, then we're adjourned. Thank you.